Praise the Lord. It's good to be covered by the blood. Let's just stand this morning. Is there any prayer requests as we would look to the Lord this morning? For your sister, yes. Okay. Brother John Crothers, yes, he's still in the hospital and still has to undergo some, maybe some surgery there later on, so. Um, all right, let's all lift up our voice together this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee, we thank You, Lord. That, Lord, we can reach Thee in prayer, Lord, and You've seen the request that has gone before Thee, Lord. Lord, there's a lot that needs a touch of healing, Lord, in their body, but not only in their body, Lord, those that may be troubled in mind as well, Lord. Lord, you're the great physician that can heal all parts of mankind and his body. And now, Lord, as we come in this service, Lord, we ask that you be in every part of it. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for things that are done. And Lord, we ever so thankful. And Lord, we remember thy nation Israel as well at this time. And I ask these things in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Paul to come lead us in the song service. It's good to see everyone this morning on this rainy day, better than snow. Thank you, Lord. Uh, maybe 119 in the blue book. Living below in this so sinful world. Hardly a comfort can afford Striving alone To face temptation so Where could I go but to the Lord Of me where Face the 
chilling hand of death Where could I go but to the Lord Where could I go Where could I go See Try number 10 in the uh, red book here.
395 in the blue book here. There is going to be a meeting in the year in the sweet Sweet by and by Don't you want to meet me over there In a land beyond the sky Such singing you will hear Never heard by mortal ear
Lord. Does anybody have anything on their hearts this morning? 99 in the, which one, the red? Okay. Thank you, Lord.
Anybody have a testimony on your hearts this morning that you're wanting to share, but not really? And <laughs> I find I always have a struggle. Uh, Satan's always right behind me every time I want to say something, and I usually start testifying, and I break down, and I start crying, so... But I think I got him beat. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else have a song upon their hearts this morning? I claim the blood. Okay. Not sure what key. I claim the blood. Jesus shed on Calvary. Oh, his precious Christ's name. i 
time as he delivered us and we prayed our way out. I'm just so thankful for the many times that he's delivered and when I look around and see all the good things he's done for me I know I'm unworthy of them all for his blessings he freely gave I owe my life to him I got so much to thank him for yes, I've got so much to thank him for so much to praise him for you see he has been so much to thank him for at times along this way I kneel to stop and say thank you Lord Slow, 
and you start getting upset and, you know, I think, well, you know, I have a car, at least I can drive and, you know, I'm, I'm not walking or taking my bicycle or yeah. calling a cab or taking a bus. And it's always about simplifying it, right? And we're, uh, we're blessed to, to have been born in an area where we have so much and sometimes we just lose sight of the problems that we could really be facing. I'm glad I can provide for my little girl and I'm glad we have food on the table, a roof over our heads. We wake up, our house is warm. Just never want to take for granted all the good things that we have. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Mary Lee and Daniel, would you have a song this morning?
Sister Brenda, do you have a song this morning? If it matters to you It matters to the master He wants to share the burden you bear He'll give you peace when your world is shattered If it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain It matters to you, matters to the master. When do you think that the giver and the maker of life is far too busy to care? your struggles and strife He sees the sparrow that falls to the ground He hears your tears that don't make a sound And if you only knew how precious you are in His sight No. Oh. 
Joyce, do you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. Brother Elijah, do you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. If you could see why I once was, if you could go with me all back to where I started from, then I know you would see a miracle of love that took in and in sweet. And made me what I am today Just a sinner saved by grace Oh, I'm just a sinner Oh, saved by grace Oh, when I stood
Everybody happy and content? I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Fred. If you'd all stand, please. I'm glad that Jesus is still on the throne of mercy. He don't change, not like we do. But then change can be good if it's for the good, as the Lord would lead us along. And uh, I'm thankful for what he's done in this hour. And he's not through yet. Jesus is still on that mercy seat. Heavenly Fathers, we come before thy throne of grace. It's only by grace that we stand, Lord. It's only by your spirit that we know anything, Lord. Lord, I just pray this morning, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. Or ask it now in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Last week we looked at the Christian life and the things that all entails with it. When we say we are born again, There's a whole lot entailed with being that new birth. For the true child of God, everything is just there in there for you, but has not been developed. When we talk about the characteristics and the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ, those things that we find in Galatians 5.22 and in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. It tells us of the qualities and the attributes that we have to come in to put on. We have to cultivate those. No, you don't do it yourself. But by that Holy Spirit, there's enough power of that Holy Ghost that he's given you. If we will allow him to work in us over time... He will bring in the characteristics and the attributes of Jesus Christ in you and I. And sometimes we're impatient. Lord, I want, I want, I should have had them 10 years ago. No. 10 years ago wouldn't have worked. You might have just got it through a head knowledge. These attributes and characteristics of Jesus Christ only comes by trials, tests, and tribulation. Why? Why? Because something has to die so something can replace to be, have a proper adi- uh, characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we concentrate on, only on the attributes of Jesus Christ as being made perfect here for the end time, then you're going to be missing on a part that is also necessary. And that's putting on the revelation of the Word of God. Now remember, 
The blood is imputed to you and I. How many of you know what the word imputed means? It's given to you. When did you, go, when did you get it? When you believed that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you and me. His blood was shed. He did one sacrifice, and one sacrifice only. And that blood is there as God looks through that blood, through you, as you're going on your journey. It's there the moment that you have come to Christ and you believe the revelation of that the blood of Christ avails for you. It's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. But somehow as we walk along, we seem to, well, maybe if I get this right, I can get that right. No, you're just cultivating, those things are to cultivate the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it's his righteousness not your and my righteousness. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. What part that we don't understand our righteousness is like filthy rags? Because we are so prone in, in this modern society, we got to figure things out. We know better. But we don't know better. That's why it's good to go back to the basic salvation and know what Jesus did. When his blood was shed for you and me, it was not just for the first week, the first month, or the first ten years. It's till you are taken home, either by the rapture or by the grave. Now, to the true believer, that applies. But the so devil comes along and says, well, you know, there's this and that, the other thing, uh, this person. He's getting to you to look at another person. You're not supposed to look at another person. You're supposed to look at Jesus Christ. And if we get our minds on our growth concerning when we look at Jesus Christ, then we will see that blood, it applies for you and I. But as the blood is applied, yes, as God sees the believer reaching out to him and he receives a true revelation of what it's for yes he knows it's going to be for his whole life but as you, you and I are starting out let's say we just was saved as a babe right there there's a whole lot of work that God has to do that blood's got to start removing that unbelieving part that's what the blood is for it's the disbelief or the wrong interpretation or, or not knowing what the Word of God is. So the blood is there to avail for you and I. And that's so that the young child doesn't go off the rails and then, well, what's the use? I just made a few mistakes and am I gone? No. It's a security. How sure is the Word of God concerning His blood? No, really. Do we really... Meditate on it. Is it just for a while or till you get into a problem? So therefore, when the devil tries to beat you that you're not good enough, the blood is there. It didn't change. But when we do things that are not good enough, we have an advocate to make that right. And if I stray and not live as I ought to, then my reward at the end of my life is going to be diminished. Right? Oh, praise the Lord. I'm just putting out. Now, this morning, Lord willing, if I can get to the place where I was looking at yesterday, it'll help open up some understanding of what's transpiring as we look at God's grace and mercy, how our salvation how he works with us, and how he deals with us. Now, as we pick up as a babe, and we start, we first of all, he gets us acquainted with the principal doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. The th and, the th and the doctrines of the apostle, how we should live a clean life. But living a clean life, and just the doctrines of the apostle does not pull, put on that revelatory garment. 
That revelatory garment is something that we have to put on by the revelation of the word that comes. Now, for each age, there's a certain requirement that God, as he works in a certain period of time, that will be their garment for that part of time. Yes, during the whole grace age, the bride will fulfill having been fully dressed with that revelatory garment. All right. So we're getting somewhere so far. The sin of unbelief is a really the sin that does someone in. And I know it's just a picture, but let's say you can look at from babe to being full to full grown, fully mature, fully dressed as being the grace age. That's wonderful. But you and I don't live some over 2,000 years. So let's look at it in realistic, more realistic terms in a generation somewheres. In a generation, no matter what period of time, whether it is in, is in Brother Branham's day or Brother Jackson's day, in each generation, there are babes that it moves into the message. Then you're under tutorship for a while. And while you're under tutorship, Christians are not blind. They see things going on. Well, how come so and so can do that? And I can't do this. And, and so they get looking in those areas and then, then wondering what's going on. While the Word of God comes on ground, let's say we were in the days of Brother Brown. Put, pick yourself in, in, the, in that period of time. While he's bringing forth the revelated word concerning the seals and so forth of the things that he brought in the, from 1963 on down. As a group of people that was in those assemblies, they, there was a mixture of people in there. They all heard the same thing. They could all talk about the same thing. And it looks like everybody is a bride saint. But that's just the appearance of it. Because while we're under tutorship, like I said, depends on what generation you want to look at. The true child of God, he sees it by the spirit that's inside. That's a revelation. And this is not a revelation. If it's something air that comes around. But... In the midst of it, there are make-believers. He receives a revelation by intelligence. And while that message is going on, and they're in that assembly, and everything seems to be going smooth, and while Brother Brown was on the scene, you couldn't tell the difference. And it's not this morning to point out who's saved and who's lost, but to point out what actually takes place? Because one God takes that servant off the scene now. Now comes the test. Who had the revelation by intelligence? And who had it by revelation? Because now that servant is gone. Those by revelation will see the next phase of God that's moving on. And we know it was the apostolic ministry. But the majority went the other way. He's a black sheep. Yet while they were in the group under that same roof, hearing the prophet, my, they could speak to one another back and forth. They were see, saying they were seeing the same revelation. But the, what identifies a true child of God from a make believer is when they move out from a message and then it goes on to the next one. Well, we know Brother Branham was a prophet. We can trust everything Brother Branham says. They're leaning on the man. They should have been leaning on the Holy Ghost because Brother Branham said some dual statements. Right? 
And so now as it goes forth, here comes a division that takes place. And as it goes forth, the true child of God is going to see the word not because, oh, I like that speaker. Or I, uh, I like the way that person brings things out. It's been the Holy Ghost inside is supposed to say, that is truth. Y'all for quiet. Well, why does God do that? He gives a generation, instilled a certain part of his revelated word that he brings them into. And he's going to test them on it. Because had Brother Branham been here all along, even to now, everybody would be hanging on and you'd have a lot of people in the message. But God sees through that. He's the one that brings forth the things in order to separate those that are truly being led by the Holy Ghost, that new birth that you trusted when you first came to him it's the same Holy Ghost you have to trust under tutorship and it's the same Holy Ghost even though God takes a man off the scene now have to by that same Holy Ghost see what's, what is truth well, well I want to turn to open your Bibles to John chapter 12 and I'm going to use something Brother Ray was talking about Verse 24 of the 12th chapter of, of the Gospel of John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And in the time of the Pentecostal church, fruit. Oh, yes, that's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, so forth. Excuse me? That's part of it. But what is the fruit that what is the fruit that he laid to begin with? What did he sow? The word. The revel, the fresh revelated word of God. Which will, yes, work on your and my of those attributes that we have to put on. And you and I can only grow into the level of those attributes as your revelation grows in the knowledge of Him. Because if this is the what's going to make me perfect... And I just need the Gospels and the... Uh, of the early church and the uh, doctrines of the apostle. Yes, we must turn to it. It's part of our makeup. All those doctrines of the early church were restored by 1963. How many know that? God did not bring new revelation before 1963. Yeah, there's an overlapping period there concerning like the week of Daniel. But as far as that ministry of that, that prophet, he restored everything that the early apostle had. And by 1963, they were all on ground. But from 1963, we're now in 2017. Almost 2018, I should say, because just a month or so. That's 55 years that they've been restored. And if we haven't been made perfect by then, in 54 years, how long is it going to take to get the rest done? But it depends how you look at perfection. In those attributes, 
Jesus gave a parable one day about the sower, that there would be 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And yes, we should shoot for the highest thing possible that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. But somewhere we have to come to a reality, maybe my capacity as a human being can only be a 30-fold. So I can only come in 30-fold of, of these attributes. And you're not going to be, you will be perfect for your and my measure. Do you get it? Yes, the devil will say, well, hey, you only got, uh, you should be a hundredfold. Everybody has to be a hundredfold. You're only, well, I think you're only 15. Because if, it, if it's been 54 years, it's been restored. Have we got another 54 years? I don't think so. That we're going to have to change a lot of things. What Jesus said about Matthew 24, that generation shall not pass away. It's going to be more than a generation. 54 to 54, that's 108 years. That's, that's over a century. I'm saying those things so we can look and understand. We, once we know truth and where we can settle in, there's peace that comes with truth. Is when I don't know and I start worrying and the devil gets on your shoulder, well, I, I'm falling short. Getting back to the basics. The blood of Jesus Christ for the true believer is there till you either go in the rapture or the grave. It's his righteousness, not mine or yours. And those attributes of Jesus Christ, what is the and God wants to turn us into that image of Christ. It's not increase in the Holy Ghost, but it's increase in that image, which is these characteristics. Well, if, you, if you're confused in what you need to grow into, it's in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. That, he, that the whom he predestinated, he, predestinated, he called, and to be conformed to the image, that's where the image is, of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, the Holy Ghost that you and I have when we receive that birth, we have a down payment, a measure of it. And you and I will not get the full measure of our measure till our body is changed. Oh, well, Lord, you shouldn't give me more. I need more. Uh, things I see. Yes, you see some things on Sunday. Come Monday or Tuesday, hmm. You're not so worried about it anymore, right? So we just go on, think just lazy, daisical, floating along. All right. But now, as those attributes are being put on, then we have to put on that revelatory garment. What age are we living in now? Aren't we living under the eagle age? We're not living under the lion age, nor the calf, nor the face of a man. And what is that eagle supposed to do? Get you to grow more into the inner qualities? Everything that you need to grow in your inner qualities are in, the, are in the Gospels or the Epistles of the early church. There is no special revelation to get you a little higher in your, the attributes that you need to have to put on a love, joy, and these things, right? There's nine. There's not, there's not 22 of the things that we need to put on. So those things are cultivated while revelation is given to you as the spirit, as you see the truth. And if I concentrate on this and I don't see the truth for my day, then you're going to end up by the time the seventh seal is broken with a miniskirt. Why do I say that? 
there's some truth that God bringing on ground that you, you just put aside for whatever reason. If God, and that eagle, it screamed in the days of Brother Branham. It screamed in the days of Brother Jackson. And somebody muzzled it during their fivefold ministry. There hasn't been one new thing. My foot. God has brought things in this hour. But because Brother Jackson didn't say it, we don't believe it. You're depending on flesh, on the intelligent revelation of the word, rather than the spirit inside showing you what truth is. Now, as we go forward, Paul in Hebrew says, let's leave the doctrines of the principles of Christ. Why? They were just playing with the gospels to be, well, I want it to be ready. Paul was saying, you've got to move on. Why does God want to move on? What do you think Jesus was saying in his parable about the wheat? Increase. Talents. Increase. Pounds. Increase. And when he comes to judge the servants, he's not saying, well, where's the ten pounds I gave you? He's saying, there's your ten. Where's your increase? All right. So let us go on to perfection. Perfection will always be, to no matter what generation, God brings something for their hour till the time that seven seal is broke. Then that ought to be finished. Now I'm back into the, where we're looking at here this morning in, the, in the John chapter 12. Now he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto the life eternal. Now here, if any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, shall my servants be. Now if I'm of a carnal mind, well, in 33 AD, Jesus went up to heaven. And if I'm following him, well, that's all I need to follow. Wrong. Yes, he was on earth, but what was he doing on earth? He was speaking the word of the Father to the earthly recipient while he walked here on earth. When he said, follow me, he didn't say, well, where, where are you going today? Are you going to Nazareth today? We're going to follow along. That's not what he meant. Follow the revelated word of God that the Father was giving him to speak to the people in that hour. But now he comes off the scene. Just like, if you want to, it's, it's a repeat. Just like Brother Branham taking off the scene and so forth. They, he delivered the word that was necessary. And the word was so simple. So simple, yet so hidden. That even the angel didn't know about the age of grace till Jesus was the one ordained to preach it. I mean, angels are much smarter than we are. Way smarter than we are. But they couldn't figure it out. Because God had hidden it from their eyes. Now, as Jesus is off the scene, where did those early apostles get the revelation they got out of thin air because Jesus is on that mercy seat he speaks from heaven oh but we didn't see him walk on the earth you ain't going to see him walk on the earth because he was one man yes the perfect son of God walking on the earth but now he's going to have men that's going to be used to spread the gospel. And they're going to hear by the Holy Ghost that was given to them what is needed to be preached. So the, uh, to follow Jesus in the days of Peter, John, and so forth, they had to follow the revelation of what was being brought forth through that apostolic ministry. Right?
In that early age, the predominant spirit that was of those living creatures was the lion spirit. Not lion, it's L-I-O-N, not the other lion, just in case somebody misunderstands. So under that lion spirit, it was how the word came to them. Jesus didn't come off the mercy seat. He sent an angel to anoint servants that would speak the very words, what they were hearing in heaven, they could hear on earth. But after 96 AD, when the book of Revelation was written, it was complete. There was no new revelation till 1963. When God started with the reformers, he started restoring little by little, one revelation after the other time uh, concerning the doctrines of the apostles. Till we reached 1963, they were all restored. You're awful quiet this morning. That's good. Maybe you're listening. But what was that? Cherubim. Now, whether cherubim, beast, or or the uh, one of the, those creatures that's before the throne, it is the eagle age that we are under. And that eagle is not a chicken on the ground picking at the earth for worms. He's a seeing bird. Yes, it's used to type something. It's to type revelation that he sees. And he cries. <laughs> Now, I've heard things like, well, you know, the five-fold ministry, Brother Branham said it's going to be so humble. They won't offend no one. My, they're, they're going to be, it's going to be so quiet that they, can, they can't say anything harsh. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus said something harsh to the Pharisees. You are your father, the devil. Well, that's, that's pretty sharp. Peter, Paul said something sharp. That was not all their ministry, but there's a come a time to say things that is needful for that, for that hour that time. But sometimes I hear things that, while the fivefold ministry is going to be so humble, it'll be, we're not under the mouse spirit. Huh? And when an eagle screams, the whole valley hears down below. The little eagles, they hear it. The tares hear it, but they want to hide. Because they don't recognize. They were leaning on the man, but they're not reading on the spirit of that eagle that is now bringing revelatory truth. So for those that would say, well, it's going to be so humble. If it's humble like a mouse, it'll, nothing will ever get done. Oh, but God, Jesus can do anything. Yes, he can. When we talk about Thessalonians, the Lord shall descend with a humble mouse spirit. It was a shout. A cry was made. The eagle sounded. It's to get their attention. Not to make people visible. But they can hear something that's of a definite sound. So what's the danger in this hour? It's found in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. 
For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth when Jesus was there, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven? And if he finished speaking from heaven in the days of Brother Jackson, the rapture should be on. I haven't seen no one raptured yet. Now if we refuse him that speaketh, Put that scripture on up here somewhere. I've got it here. So you can read it along. After tutorship, this is where the bride, not to identify people, but to know what's going on and to know where truth is at. This then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all he's every bit truth no error in God well that's that should go without saying that's a straightforward understanding but if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. How do I walk in darkness? Now, I don't mean to hit on the Brenham line of people and so forth, but as an example... While they had light, they were walking in the light. But then when God takes that messenger off the scene, and the movement stays there and running in circles in Branham's message, then darkness starts to set in because they're not seeing the revelation under that apostolic ministry. Be care- uh, another scripture talks about, be careful that darkness does not overtake you. How does darkness overtake you? It's when you stop. And not recognizing your hour, that you are now falling into darkness. It's not pitch black. But as time goes on, goes on as God reveals more and more as time goes on, then there's going to be, where the, if I'm staying here... The light has moved on and I'm getting into more darkness and more darkness as, I, as time goes on. Oh, okay, what's this one here? Yes. So if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, oh, that's way back there in the diamond of Jesus. Him that's speaking from heaven did not just spoke when he walked on earth and in the early apostles. He spoke during Brother Branham's day. He spoke through Brother Jackson's day. And the fivefold ministry is not there as an ornament. He's speaking through it today. Now he says here, Here, the blood of Jesus Christ, to the true believer, yes, it applies to him till he leaves. But to those that are not really through, have it through an intelligent or intellectual understanding, here's what's happened. But if, if it's conditional, if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Now put this down in reality so you can see this morning. While Brother Brown was alive, those that walked at that hour, while they were walking in the light of the word he was bringing, the blood was cleansing them. 
But now God moves on a little further and brings on ground a word and they disbelieve it. Does the blood avail for them? For the true believer, he'll walk on the sea light. But the make believer, that's where it stops. That's why they run in circles. Now, not everybody sees the truth all at the same time. There's an hour and a time for each and every one of us to come into the light of the truth. So if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Now, oh, we can get a, a carnal or a simple illustration. Oh, that's the light when Jesus walked on earth. When Jesus walked on earth and he... He gave the Father's word for that hour while he was speaking. Is that all he knows? Who gave it to Peter? Who gave it to the Apostle Paul? The same one, although he's not on earth, is now he's moved on in light. And when it came to time that he that a prophet was on the scene. Was Jesus still stuck in the past there from there, the first age? No, he's walking in the same light as that ministry was on the earth because he's the one originating to send the angel to have that spoken. And if he's, the, if he's to walk in light as he is in light, what light is Jesus walking into today? When he walked on earth? Just in the days of the apostle? Just in the days of Brother Branham? Just in the days of Brother Jackson? Surely in 14 years God has should have opened up some things. Yeah, but we don't know because there's this one that says that and that and the other thing. The problem is you're not leaning on the Holy Ghost. You're leaning on your intelligence trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. That's where the problem arises. But there's a danger. If I stop at the border of Brother Brown's message, when Jesus says, he came to the Pharisees one day, he said, if I had not spoken to you, you would have no unbelief. I couldn't charge you with anything. But because I spoke... You have no cloak to hide under. Because the word's on ground, revealing their day. What happened in the days of the apostles? The very same thing. When the word came on ground, it revealed those that didn't want to walk with the Lord, that was trying to bring in circumcision, or these other things that took place in the early church, they had their battles too. And in the days of Brother Branham, Oh, while the gifts were operating, God allowed him to be, yes, have that meek, humble spirit, not offend someone, when the gifts was operating, because God was trying to pull a people in from all walks of life to come to, and finally, he would now bring a message that people would hear. Did the denomination... Or the Pentecostal, or the Independent, or the Evangelical. Did they move on? And here's some buzzwords to keep their people in line. Do you know what I mean by a buzzword? A phraseology. Well, the bride, or the servant of God should be humble. The servant of God should have love. And the love, their meaning is the love like you see in the world. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments or my saying or my revelation for the hour. Because if you don't like that, sorry, you don't have the love of God, you have human love. Yes, and there's nothing wrong with loving one another on that aspect. Because the love of God will also love our brothers and sisters. But that's not the first commandment. The first commandment, love thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and so forth. And his word, how do we love God? Oh, Lord, somehow we can just imagine, put your arm around him. 
You love his thoughts, which is him. Which is the word. Well, I don't mean to shout, but yes, I do. If I was here to preach you like a mouse, I hope you're all comfortable. Do you think you might want to look a little bit in this chapter? It would be nice if you did. Now, when it comes time for the word, it'll have the spirit like the eagle. It'll scream at times. And at times, it'll be just meek. So one of the buzzwords, well, not humble. He's trying to make a kingdom for himself. When the scripture described as being humble, it's not putting out programs trying to increase yourself to the world and do like the Jehovah Witness or the Mormons, going outreach and doing things on your own, trying to grab more people into the assembly. First of all, the others see what happened in the early church. God added to the church daily as he saw fit. You can't add any more because all you're going to add is tears and trouble. Right? So that's why we don't, I don't believe in going knocking the doors because I've had them lately, had the Mormons and had the Joe Witness coming by. Oh, they want to talk to you because you're thinking, they think we're, I'm in a Catholic area, they think I'm Catholic. But when they come up with someone that has knowledge of the truth, poop, oh, oh, well, we'll see you later. <laughs> bye bye. Not to be mean to them, but if I, Try to show them a bit of truth, I'm going to end up with an argument. How do I know? I've had some previous examples before. You, you don't have to listen to them. You just politely say, sorry, you got your belief, and I got mine. And, and what I see, it's, it's where I'm at. <laughs> so don't trouble me. All right. Then another buzzword. I can prove it by the word that what I say is true. Yeah. Give it the word test. I can go to a Baptist church. And if they allow me to, to testify or to preach... And say, God's not a trinity. They'll say, I can prove to you by the word of God, God is a trinity. I give it the word test. The test that they're giving is this. In the interpretation, how they see the scriptures, not what the word really says. What is the test of the word? When it comes on ground and being fulfilled, that's the vindication of it. There's even preachers in, in the world today, I should put it that way. You have it even from the denominational point of view. I forget what his name is. He, he's always said, well, I can prove by the Bible, and the Bible says it. And you go back a year later, and he's not saying the same thing. A true revelation cannot be shot down. A false one, if you give it time... It's going to show its head and it's going to flop. Guaranteed. Because God will see to it that it is. All right. Now, if we say that we have no sin, that we have no unbelief, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say, well, the blood cleanses me, I got no unbelief. The, through the blood he sees you clean... But why does he need to clean us up? What is he cleaning? Does he want you to keep the Trinity doctrine? Sprinkling? No, those things he cleans out. Well, praise the Lord. All right. The 
other thing is stick with the word. That more or less yes you'll hear it in the denomination but it was really more predominant in the days of Brother Branham. Stick with the word. And they have done that. They stuck with the word. They even stuck with the books. But God has moved on but they're just sticking with their understanding where they're at. To stick with the word is to stick with the word where as God works and opens things up. Well, so he says here, Jesus said himself in, in 12 and 35, while you have the light, he was speaking in, in the day, yes, it applied to that hour, but it can be applied as wherever the light is shining in the hour. It doesn't necessarily mean he's speaking it direct, because in the, since he went into glory, he's, he doesn't come on the earth and does it direct. So while you have the light, go on walking in it, so that the darkness may not overtake you. Well, Jesus, you shouldn't have said that. The true, the true child, it would not overtake him. There's four kinds of seed that was sown. And those that have an intellectual revelation... They cannot go any further than where they're at. Because that's why they'd have to walk into further truth. And so therefore when they stop and God has moved on, then they are in darkness. Is the Pentecostal church walking in truth and light today? They had it in the hour and God was dealing with them in the days gone by. Because that's what God had worked at to that point. But then when God started moving on further, as we had an, a prophet on the scene, as we have an apostle on the scene, they are now so dark, to them spiritually so dark, that they can't bridge the gap to come what God's doing now. But they're good people. I know they are. Who's, who's allowing this? The Lord is. He, he said when, to his disciples, I did not come to bring peace on the earth, I came to bring a sword that would cause division. And here's some of the things. Let's say if I went to, a, to the Branham Church or to a Pentecostal church, and I start preaching to them that there's three watches in the Bible. Jesus spoke about it in Luke chapter 12. So what about if I come in the second watch? Or if I come in the third watch? Well, if there's only one watch, Jesus, why did you say two or three? Because there would be a second and third watch. The so watches are related to the ministry that would be on the ground. The first watch was Brother Branham. The second watch was Brother Jackson. And the fivefold ministry is the third watch. Watching for what? The attributes of Jesus Christ? That's not a watchman. That's a gospel man. He wants, he's talking about watching his coming. And from the days of Brother Branham, yes, it was shown that there would be a seventh seal one day would be broke and that the Lord would come. But when Brother Jackson came on the scene, the apostle, he opened a whole lot more thing that we could see a little closer. But don't dare touch anything today. Because nobody knows. Jesus said we would not know the day or the hour. But we will know the season. How that became so clear. When Jesus told the disciples... When he walked before he went to glory in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 27 and 37, he says, It's not for you to know the time or the season concerning its coming. Because a whole lot of things that 
Even if you told them, they, it would have been abstract to them. But there would come a time that they would know. Somebody would know. Now, in case you don't know, if you've never heard it before, and, and yes, if you want to, look at what Brother Jackson said about it, if you want to, if that's what you want. Times and season means centuries and decades. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know. Does that mean nobody's going to know? Surprise, I'm here. No. And if we are to know something, it has to be on a scriptural point of view, a prophetic point of view, and not just a wimp wimp and a guess and so forth. Did not Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24, 32, when you see the fig tree put forth a bud and puts forth leaves, that generation will not pass away. A generation don't live a century. So therefore, centuries, as far as time going on, is over when 1948 came on the scene. There would be no more 100 years before the Lord's coming. Then, but that generation of your World War II veterans, most of them in wheelchairs and they're in their late 90s, they're not going to be a ministry that's going to finish this out. Uh Uh-uh. They're not going to be ministering from a wheelchair. But Jesus said, when he puts forth more leave, which means people. When did Israel put more people on the earth? You have to look to a prophetic event. And in 1967, in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall no longer be occupied by the Gentile. More land was acquired. And so the leaves are starting to be put on. He didn't say all the leaves were there. When it starts to put forth leaves. So now, we know that it has to be this generation. That Jesus is talking about that that generation shall not pass away till everything be fulfilled. So we know a little closer. And a generation, according to Psalms, is three score and ten, which is 70 years old, or by the reason of strength, 80 years old. Now, if that's your generation there, from 67 to 2017, you have gone five decades, 50 years. Only someone that would blind or naysayer that don't like truth will say, no, that's wrong. Hey, we've gone 50 years, five decades. Because when centuries end it, you're now counting decades. And as those decades now come into play, you have at the most from 2017, 20 years before, the Je- before Jesus' physical second coming. Because he said all things would be fulfilled even concerning his second coming. So therefore, how many years do we have till the miracle war takes place? Has God opened up something that we can see it a little closer? No, we don't know the year that war is going to take place. We don't know the year of the rapture. Well, so the watches... It's found, the first watch is in Matthew 25 and 13. That's the days of Brother Branham. The second watch is in Luke chapter 12, 38. Because Jesus says, watch in the second watch. What did he say? What about if I come in the second one, a second watch? Now, what do you mean? Oh, it's at midnight, maybe 9 to 12, four, uh, 12 to, uh, to, one, to 3. He's not talking about the hours of the day. He's talking about watching his coming. And as he's watching, he's coming. What about if it's in the third watch? And after he finished saying that, he said, if the good man, now while during those watch, he said, if the good man of the house had been watching concerning his coming, he would not have had his house broken in. Had he been attentive to the revelation and not following man, he would know how close he's getting to the Lord's coming. 
Don't tell me there's another 50, 100 years. I can say, thus saith the Lord, you have 20 at the most before his physical second coming. Because Jesus said that generation. He didn't say that centuries is, will not pass away. Does that make sense to you? I mean, and if I'm saying and I'm false, then God ought to raise someone up to speak something to kill it. But I haven't heard a thing. Now, I'm not saying that as braggadocious, but somewhere we've got to look at truth. That Holy Ghost that leads us. Let's not fall asleep at the end. Because the watching is not the watching how those attributes are being applied to us. And that is important as it is. But that revelatory garment is part of the revelatory garment that the bride knows how close she's going to be before Jesus comes for his bride. Hallelujah. What more can I say? Well, I'll just stop there for this morning. This could go on another hour. But I don't believe in going on an extra hour. Because if you stay too long, you're going to forget what even was heard in the first place. I had a wise professor one day when I was going to high school. He says, I'm not going to bore you to death. Because he says, I know from experience that your attentive or your attention span is 20 minutes after that, it starts to fall off real quick. Right? And it's much quicker when I went to some of the classes I was going to where they were teaching literature. I was gone in five minutes. Why? It was dull. All right. Leaving that as it be. Let's just stand this time. Heavenly Father, I thank you once again, Lord. Lord, not because of the word I say, but let your spirit, I pray. That new birth, Lord. Open the eyes, Lord, of, of us, Lord, in the hour that we live in, that we see, Lord, that you're still on the throne. That eagle is still screaming today. And Lord, it will scream till the time you break that seventh seal. And now, Lord, I commit this part of the service in your hands. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. If someone still has a need, I'll ask the musicians to come and praise the Lord. You can be seated.
Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, for allowing us to gather, Father, and hearing your servant, Lord, and I pray, Father, quicken this message to our hearts, give us wisdom and understanding. We pray for the ministry in this hour, Father. There seems to be so much coming against it, Lord, and we just covet, Father, your inspiration and your word, Father, and we're thankful for each one that's here this day. Father, we pray be with each one as we make our way home. Bring us all back here safely once again, Father. We give you thanks, Father, in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.